Um, so the last, uh, you know, for most of this lecture series, we've been talking about uh, everyday applications of particle physics, or at least um, uh, applications of particle physics technology that, that at least have the potential to become mainstream. Um, and, uh, and today we're just going to completely uh, ignore that, and we're going to go back to why are we building this technology in the first place? Why are we building particle accelerators and detectors? And so a large part of that is going to be um, giving you an idea of what's, what's our understanding, what's our current uh, theory of how fundamental particles interact and what they are, um, and uh, how successful this theory is, and it's, it's very successful. It's been around for, for going on 40 years now. Um, and, uh, but then, what are the problems associated with it? And of course, those of you who've been attending these lectures, I'm sure you've heard most of this material at some point, but, uh, but we'll go over it to make sure we're all on the same page. So finally, then we'll wrap up with how, how will the Large Hadron Collider uh, help us to clear up some of these outstanding problems with our, our current understanding. Um, so uh, so it's, a, it's a lot of material to get through in about an hour. Um, what I'm going to do is, is try to give you just a, a broad overview of, of, uh, of what we do know, uh, what we don't know, and, um, and give you some flavor for, for how all of these fundamental particles interact. Um, and uh, I'll try to leave enough time at the end for, for, uh, for questions, because um, this is going to be kind of a, a, a broad lecture, but maybe not so deep. Um, all right, so this is it. Um, if you've seen, uh, it, it, you know, again, if you've been to these lectures in the past, you've probably seen something very similar to this table. This is, um, this is all of the fundamental particles uh, that we know about. This is everything that's been discovered. Um, up till now, and uh, you know, arranged in this way, it, it might remind you of another table of uh, you know, what was previously thought to be fundamental particles, you know, the, the periodic table of the elements. Um, of course, our version in particle physics is a lot simpler. You know, there's there's not hundreds of things. We have you know, we have 12 bits of matter, and uh, and then we have these guys that correspond to uh, forces. So. Um, so what are the what are the features of this of this uh, theory of this way of laying things? Out? Um, first of all, the, the, the term we use for this is uh, is standard model. You may have heard this a few times. We call this thing the standard model of particle physics, and the the name itself is kind of misleading because it uses two words that that are, we're generally familiar with and, and puts them together in kind of a weird way. Um, so what's what's standard about it, and what, why are we calling it a model? Um, it's, it's become the standard because in, uh, in the late um, 1960s, early 1970s, uh, uh, physicists developed the mathematical framework for describing uh, interactions between particles um, in terms of uh, uh, interactions with force carriers. And these, these things that carry forces, so for example, I've talked a lot about the photon, um, that thing carries the electromagnetic force and it's responsible for uh, electrical repulsion, electrical attraction, um, and photons are responsible for um, electromagnetic waves, um, you know, like radio waves, x-rays, x all of these things uh, propagating through space. That's all the photon. So this mathematical theory of how these particles interact with these forces was laid out um, about 40 years ago, and, and it became so successful that it, it kind of became the standard. It was the, the standard way of thinking about, uh, about fundamental physics. Um, and, uh, and we call it a model because uh, theoretical physicists do all sorts of what they call model building. It's a mathematical model, um, and uh, most of them don't necessarily describe the reality we live in. Uh, this one uh, seems to be particularly successful at, at doing that. So, uh, so we call it the standard model. Um, what are the features of it? It's, it's got 12 fundamental <coughs> particles, and uh, we divide them up um, in a few ways. Um, uh, you know, the color coding here uh, tells you at the top here we've got these things called quarks. Um, these are responsible for, uh, for nuclear matter. Um, and you have down here the leptons, the one you're probably familiar with is, is the electron. Um, and I'll, remind, I'll go into detail on all of these. Um, and then the last bit here is the force carriers. Uh, what else do we see here? We, we see we have um, three uh, columns of matter. And what distinguishes these things is really only um, the mass. So for example, the down quark, uh, which is found inside protons and neutrons, um, is very similar to, say, the, the bottom quark, um, except uh, the only difference is this thing is 
um, 500 times heavier, or something like that. Yeah, I think it's around 500 times heavier. So it's uh, it's there, there, there's a other than that, they're exactly the same. They have the same uh, uh, interactions with the electromagnetic force. They have the same interactions with the weak nuclear force, at least very similar, um, and uh, uh, similar interactions uh, with the strong nuclear force. So, um, so this is kind of a puzzle in, in, a, in a sense that we'll get back to. You know, why are why are there three that, that seem to be copies? Um, and, and and this this problem's not new. It goes back uh, even even farther than this model of thinking about things. It started actually with uh, the discovery of this guy, the muon. It's a heavier version of the electron. Same electric charge, same other properties. The only difference is it's heavier. Um, and uh, uh, it was discovered in the late, mid to late 1930s and uh, led this physicist, uh, Isidore Rabi, to ask uh, who ordered that. It was completely unexpected. You know, at that time, people knew about, uh, uh, they didn't know about the up and the down quark, but they knew about protons and neutrons, which are made up of these things. They knew about the electron, and the neutrino was starting to be accepted as, as something that might exist. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you get uh, this guy. Um, so, uh, and that process continued, you know, that led to the second generation of matter, and then in the uh, 1970s um, is when we started getting evidence for a third generation. So, um, so it's, a, it's a, a bit of a mystery, but, but that's, that's what we have to work with. Um, and given that, um, all, of this, uh, all, all of the successes of the theory come down, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you what those are. Um, and just while I'm mentioning this guy, um, this is actually the no only Nobel Prize I mentioned. He, he got that in 1944, not for the discovery of the muon, but actually for um, techniques related to um, uh, uh, MRIs, or the technology that went into MRIs, which you might remember from going on a month ago. Um, all right, so uh, this is the only Nobel Prize I mentioned, uh, simply because there, there are so many Nobel Prizes that went into creating this theory of particle physics that I, I don't have time to mention them all. So, um, uh, all right, so let's, let's get into it a little bit now. Um, so let's talk about the quarks. Um, these are the things that make up, at least the up and the down quark here, these things make up protons and, uh, and neutrons. They experience all of the known forces, including one that, that we haven't talked about very much so far. So what we have talked about so far is the electromagnetic force. We've talked about that quite a bit. Um, I've talked a little bit about the weak nuclear force. That's the one that's responsible for radioactive decay. Um, and so we have, we have talked about radioactive decay in a few of the lectures. Um, the one I haven't talked about so much is the strong nuclear force. Um, and that's the thing that, that holds protons and neutrons together. Um, now the strong nuclear force is, is actually, I mean it sounds, I'm starting to throw out terms that you may not be familiar with, but it's actually not too different in some ways from the electromagnetic force. What I mean by that is it still has a concept of positive and negative in some sense, um, but there are, um, it, it, so it has a concept of positive and negative charges, but uh, they're, um, they're a little bit different. It's, or what distinguishes it from the electromagnetic force is that there's three copies of these. And I've, I've labeled them with uh, three different colors um, because it, it turns out to be a useful mnemonic later. They, these have no relation at all to regular color as we think of it. It's just a, a way of distinguishing three different types of charge. So you know, the electromagnetic force only has one type of charge, and it's we just call it electric charge, positive or negative. Here we have a red charge, a green charge, and a blue charge. So this is this is just how we label them. Um, and uh, so what, what keeps this thing from just being three plain old copies of the electromagnetic force is that um, you can get a neutral out of taking uh, a positive and a negative charge of the same color. That's kind of familiar from the electromagnetic force. But what's unfamiliar is that if you take three of these positives, that can also give you an overall neutral. And, uh, and this is why we use the color analogy, because if you take you know, three different colors, red, green, and, and blue, and mix them all together, you know, you can get white. In, in this theory, that's uh, that's neutral. So that's that's why we use this color analogy. Um, and uh, this is this is what holds the proton together. It's the interaction of these different charges. Um, the other thing that distinguishes it from the electromagnetic force is that this force is just so much stronger. Um, that's why we call it the strong nuclear force. And so uh, so what's inside the proton? You have these. Uh, quarks, and in the proton it's up, up, down. The neutron, the only thing that's different is that there's, uh, it would be down, down, up. 
Um, that's, that's the only difference there. Um, but you see here, you've got three different colors. That makes this whole thing uh, neutral in the sense of the strong nuclear force. And, and that's one of the reasons we don't observe it outside of atomic nuclei. Um, the things holding it together, instead of being called photons, uh, they're, called, they're called gluons because they act like uh, glue. I mean, that's, that's actually where, where it came from. Um, and that's where the term came from. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's, this, um, it's like the photon, except it's much stronger. And it has this property of taking three of the same charge uh, if they're different colors and, and making it overall neutral. So, um, uh, so that's how we get protons and neutrons. Um, one thing that's kind of curious uh, about the strong force and about quarks uh, is that we've never seen um, a free quark on its own. Quarks are always bound up inside protons and neutrons or other types of subatomic particles, but they're never, they're never just there on their own. Um, the reason for that has to do with how strong this force is. So if I take an example of, uh, this, is, this is one of the simplest things you can do. You can take an, an up quark with a, but here I've got a, a positive red charge, and here I've got a, a down quark, um, except this bar over it is it indicating that it's the antimatter version. Um, the only thing that that does for our purposes is it gives you a negative red charge. So you have positive red, negative red. That's an attractive charge, or an attractive force. So this part's kind of similar to the electromagnetic force. And the thing holding it together is uh, uh, the um, strong nuclear force, the, the glue ones. <coughs> so if you try to get uh, a quark out of this, if you want to just observe a single quark on its own, um, you could imagine trying to pull this thing apart. And so as you're, as you're pulling these two things apart, you're, you're stretching them apart somehow. Um, you, have to, you have to find some way to put energy into the system to, uh, to pull them apart. And here's where the real difference comes in from the electromagnetic force. It is, if you imagine taking two magnets, you know, and you put them together, and you try to pull them apart, it's really hard when you get started, but as the distance gets farther and farther, that force drops off and it's easier to pull them apart. That doesn't happen here with this particular force. With the strong force, it actually gets even stronger as you pull them apart. It acts more like a spring. So uh, you try to pull these things farther and farther apart. You have to add more and more energy into the system um, until uh, what happens, you get enough energy that you can actually create um, the mass of a particle and an antiparticle. And it's kind of like the spring breaks. And uh, now you've created, here's your, say for example, a, an up quark and an anti-up. There's your particle and your antiparticle. And um, in trying to separate these things, all you've done is create more quarks. You can't ever pull them apart uh, because as soon as you put enough energy in the system, uh, it snaps and you just make more quarks and they're still bound together. So, um, so uh, that's, that's why we only, um, we've never observed these things on their own, but we have been able to send high energy probes, uh, so high energy electrons, <coughs> high energy uh, gamma rays, into protons and neutrons and, and see that there are these uh, things that, that behave as, as very small points of matter. Um, so we know that they, they do exist inside the proton and neutron, but we can't get them out. Um, so uh, so that's, that's the strong force. The reason I'm talking about the strong force so much right now is just because we haven't re really covered it. So I just wanted to give you some, some idea of what that's about. Um, the other thing, I said quarks experience all known forces. Um, the, uh, the weak force uh, has a role to play here in connecting uh, things in this upper row to things in this lower uh, row. Um, this is, they, they can communicate with each other uh, through the weak force. So, um, so for example, with radioactive decay, um, with uh, beta decay in particular, um, what you have inside a, a proton or a neutron is an up quark converting to a down quark or vice versa um, and, uh, and spitting out um, uh, beta rays, basically. And that happens through the weak force allowing communication between these, these two rows. Um, so, uh, so that's the strong force, that's the weak force. The other thing I want to, tell, uh, want to say about the quarks before we move on is um, something about how heavy they are. Um, there's really this bizarre um, distribution of, of uh, masses for the quarks. So if you imagine each of these blobs as a, as a sphere, the size of the sphere is proportional to how massive the thing is. The actual quarks are, um, they, they have no size at all to the precision with, with which we can uh, detect size. So, um, so this is, this is just meant to give you an idea of how massive they are. 
And here's up and down quarks. These are things inside the, the proton and the neutron. And then there are these other two generations of, of matter, and they're, they're heavier. And then especially this guy at the top is, is almost as heavy as a gold atom. Um, so I mean, it's, it's really heavy. Um, and these things are all <coughs> short-lived. They decay very rapidly. Um, so we can only create them for very uh, fleeting moments in, uh, in particle accelerator um, or particle uh, collisions. Um, so we'll get back to this also. The, the masses are not predicted by our theory. The masses are put in um, by hand, basically. And, uh, and the theory allows for the masses. And, and once you put that in, you get all of this success. But, um, but again, it doesn't, it doesn't predict it. So, uh, so keep that in mind. I mean, the, the difference in scale here is this thing is about 40,000 times heavier than, than the lightest quark, than the up quark. So it's, it's really kind of a strange um, distribution. I, I, I was going to say pattern, but there's not even a pattern to it. Um, so that's, that's kind of curious. Um, we'll talk about these guys next, the leptons. And again, the ones that you're, you've heard me talk about mostly are the electrons. I've talked a little bit about the neutrinos, but not very much. So um, uh, what's going on down here is um, these guys all have a, a negative charge, uh, electric charge. These guys all have um, uh, zero electric charge. They're neutral. Um, but, uh, but other than that, there's a lot of similarities uh, between how these guys interact and how these guys interact. The biggest difference is that the leptons down here don't experience the strong nuclear force. They only experience the weak nuclear and the electromagnetic force. Um, so, there's a question. And gravity. Actually, gravity, that's a, that's a good point. I haven't mentioned gravity. Um, why haven't I mentioned gravity? Because the masses of these things, even the top quark, which is the most massive that we know about, um, the masses of all of these things are, are too small for, uh, for gravity to play a role um, in any of the experiments that we conduct. And what I mean play a role, gravity is always there, but its effects are so, so tiny, they affect you out to the you know, nth decimal place. You, it, you can basically approximate it without having gravity at all. Um, we'll come back to gravity at the end. But, uh, but yeah, I should, yeah that, that's a good point. This is a disclaimer that um, there, gravity is not accounted for here. I'll take one more question about this and then we'll move on. So, you had a question? Yes, please. If models are supposed to be the predictors of the behavior of phenomena, uh, what is the debate like within the community? It depends on who you talk to. In my community, where we're doing um, experiments, um, I'll tell you that most people tend to um, just take this as a given. And they say, once, once we accept this, we don't talk about where it comes from, um, then, uh, then we can make predictions and do experiments and see uh, how well the predictions match what we, what we see in the lab. Um, on the theoretical side, um, people are a lot more concerned with um, you know, why do we have three generations of matter? Why, why do we have three different forces? Um, I'll come back to that at the end also. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's not a settled question. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, what can we say about the, uh, the leptons here? Uh, they do experience the weak nuclear force. And again, it, it allows communication between the upper row and the lower row here. So um, the other half of nuclear beta decay, when you spit out an electron and a neutrino, comes from, uh, from this side here. Um, and it's these guys communicating with the weak force which in turn communicated with the up and the down quark. Um, these guys have, uh, again, a strange distribution of masses. You know, this thing's the tau lepton is about 3,000 times heavier than the electron. Um, we're not sure why. Um, but, uh, but once you accept it, uh, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I guess, uh, in a sense, kind of like a black box or black magic. Uh, uh, once you accept it, then everything seems to work out. It's kind of interesting. Um, the other thing I haven't put on here is, what about the neutrinos? Um, these are just the, the ones with a, an electric charge. Uh, the neutrinos, do they have masses? It turns out they do, but the masses are so tiny, we haven't been able to measure them yet. Um, we know that they're many thousands of times smaller than, than the electron's mass. Um, so, uh, so you've got a scale of you know, 3,000 between these two guys, but then many more thousands between, you know, say, the electron and the neutrino. So it's, um, it's uh, again, it's kind of, it's kind of strange. Um, and actually, this part of the lecture, I was, I was going to just focus on, you know, 
the, the, the good things about the standard model, but uh, but I might as well throw in uh, you know mix into it what what's <coughs> but, um, the last thing I'll mention about the neutrinos um, is that uh, they actually can um, turn into each other, uh, and and what I mean by this is so for example in the sun. Um, there's a lot of nuclear processes going on, and it puts out a lot of these electron neutrinos because it's, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, nuclear beta decay happening in the sun. Um, so we think we know how the sun works. We know how many electron neutrinos it should be putting out. Um, and then when we actually measure how many arrive uh, here on Earth, we only get about a third of what we expect. And uh, over the last 10, 15 years, it's been determined that these electron neutrinos are just becoming the other two types of neutrinos, and they're all kind of oscillating back and forth into each other uh, continuously. Um, so that's kind of a, that, that's actually a fairly recent discovery. Some people would even say that, they could argue and say that this is actually not part of the standard model. It wasn't originally. Um, it, neutrinos had um, uh, zero mass originally in, in terms of how people thought of them. And the only way you can get this uh, interaction or this oscillation is if they have some mass some non-zero mass. And so, um, so this is kind of a recent addition to the standard model. I still include it as part of the standard because um, mathematically, uh, you can treat it the same as everything else that's already in there. You don't have to introduce anything new. Um, you just have to um, give up one of your assumptions. And your assumption is that neutrinos have no mass. Um, all right, so, uh, so this is kind of a whirlwind tour. The last thing I want to mention about the standard model is um, something that we've all heard a lot about, is uh, the, the Higgs boson. Um, this is Peter Higgs. Uh, he, he introduced uh, the mathematics of this to the, uh, to the particle physics community. And um, I think we've, many of us have heard that the, the Higgs boson is the thing that endows all of the particles with mass. It gives, uh, it gives mass to, uh, to the universe. That's actually something you hear in the popular science media, but it's not, it's not precisely true. Before I move on to the, the Higgs, I just want to remind people of actually where most of the mass in the universe comes from. So to do that, we're going to talk about the proton again. And uh, if, you were, if you were really quick or if you're looking at your handout, you'd notice the mass of these um, up quarks and the down quarks. You know, these are like four or five million electron volts each. This guy's about eight. So you have something like around 15 to 20 million electron volts of, uh, of mass just from um, the quarks inside the proton. But the proton itself is about 50 times heavier than that. So, so what's, what's going on here? Um, where's that mass coming from? It's actually coming from uh, this strong nuclear force holding everything together. That force has so much energy associated with it um, that uh, when you're looking at the proton or the neutron from, from outside, um, because of Einstein's E equals MC squared, you don't see all of that energy. You just see uh, the, the effect of the inertia that it gives to the proton. It, it, uh, that energy actually looks like the mass of the proton. So this is one of those weird things where, where you have this play off uh, between energy and mass. And, um, and it's actually the strong nuclear force that gives mass to the proton, to the neutron, and to just about everything else we're familiar with. Um, it's, not, it's not the Higgs. The Higgs does give mass to the quarks, but those are a really small fraction, like 2% of the mass of the proton. So, um, so with that caveat, remember, mass really comes from the strong force. All of the mass out in the universe, us, stars, everything, is mainly from the strong nuclear force. What does the Higgs do? The Higgs actually gives mass to the, other, to the fundamental particles in the, in the theory. Um, and uh, the way it does this is, um, is kind of weird. Um, so how do, how do most of the um, particles and, and fields work that we deal with? If you think about the lowest energy state of, of all of these particles or, or of the photon or something, the lowest energy state, um, this is going to sound kind of obvious, is um, zero particles. You, know, you have, if you're talking about, say, up quarks, the lowest amount of energy you could have when you're talking about up quarks is none of them at all. Um, the Higgs is not like that. Um, the Higgs uh, energy, if you want to think about it like that, looks something like this, where zero Higgs is here in the middle at the top of this hill. Um, and uh, as, you, as you go away from zero, you roll down this hill, and then you get to a lower energy state. What this means is that the lowest energy state for the Higgs 
is is non-zero. It's it's um, it's a state where you have the Higgs permeating throughout all of the space. Um, the way I think about this, and I, I, it's 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 really tough to get an intuitive picture of this, but the way that kind of works for me is um, you think about this Higgs filling all of space, uh, and it, it fills it kind of like water, and. Uh, Things that are smooth, like you can imagine an electron um, being a smooth marble passing through the water, it's got uh, very little um, friction. It's not, uh, it's not interacting very much with the water. What that means in terms of the Higgs is that the electron is not interacting very much with the Higgs as it's passing through space. And so, uh, so it passes through relatively unhindered. You know, the electrons are light. Um, they, can, uh, they can pass through pretty easily. The top port, the heaviest uh, fundamental particle we've detected would be something you can imagine as being much rougher, um, having a having a very rough surface that um, that uh, experiences a lot of drag as it's moving through this fluid. Um, and what that means is that the top fork interaction with the Higgs is uh, is a much stronger interaction, and uh, and so you need more energy if you want to propel it through space. Um, so uh, so that's the weird thing about the Higgs. It, it, it's lowest energy state. Is not zero particle. It's it's you know, filling space everywhere. Um, so that's that's kind of how we say um, the Higgs gives mass to everything. It's the interaction between the particles and the Higgs that that um, appears as if it's a mass. We don't actually put masses into our equations. Um, it, it's it comes from this uh, this interaction. Um, now that being said, this doesn't solve any problems. I said the the distribution of masses seemed kind of random, where there was very little pattern to it. All I've done is swept that over to saying um, the interaction strengths with the Higgs are, are vastly different. And um, so I haven't explained anything, really. I've just, um, uh, it, it has some nice mathematical features um, that I'm not going to go into. But uh, it, it, in terms of doing math this way, as opposed to just putting it in by hand. So, um, so what's, what's the big deal about the Higgs? Well, it's the only part of this standard theory that we haven't detected. And um, it's kind of like the keystone. You've got an arch here, and it's it's kind of supporting everything. It, it gives mass to uh, to your leptons. It gives mass to your quarks. It gives mass to these weak force carriers. And um, if the Higgs boson uh, isn't here, um, this mathematical structure falls apart. We we need something to uh, to replace. We would need something to re to replace this. Um, so that's why that's why there's so much emphasis on finding uh, the Higgs particle and, and seeing uh, whether it actually interacts in, in the way we think it does. Everything I've told you for the last five minutes is all theory, and um, it would be really nice to to actually detect this guy and um, and see if our theory matches reality. Um, all right, so that's in a in a very broad brush. That's that's our standard un uh, understanding of how uh, fundamental particles. Interact. Um, what is this done for us? Um, it's explained. It's provided an explanation for essentially um, every particle physics experiment we've done for the last 40 years and longer. Um, it's predicted. Um, actually, it was, you know, I said it was developed in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. It actually predicted the existence of these W and Z, these weak force carriers which were, uh, were detected at particle collider experiments at CERN in, in uh, 1983. Here's an example of uh, one of those experiments. Um, it, uh, it predicted, or gave the framework at least, for, for saying we should expect the top fork, um, which was eventually uh, discovered um, about 20 years after, after people predicted it might be there. And that was done just down the road in Fermilab at uh, the CDF experiment and the, the D0 experiment. Um, so those are some successes. It's, it's predicted uh, particles. We've looked and we found them. We kind of hope that a similar thing happens with the, the Higgs boson. It's the last uh, remaining particle um, uh, that we haven't yet detected in the lab. Um, the other thing it, it explains is the asymmetry between how matter interacts and how antimatter interacts. Um, you know, we've got normal matter all around us. And we think that at the Big Bang, matter and antimatter were created in equal amounts. So in order for there to be anything left over, you have to have a slight preference for matter um, remaining and, and not completely annihilating with, uh, with antimatter. And so you probably can't tell that the matter ball here is just a little bit bigger. Um, because in our standard theory of physics, um, 
there is a very slight preference for matter. So, uh, so that's good. We, uh, you know, we like to see that at least it does predict that, that we should be here. Um, I'll come back to this though because there's a big asterisk after that. Um, and, uh, and then the last thing, probably one of its biggest successes, although maybe not the most impressive, is something it says about the magnetic field around an electron. So you know an electron has a, a negative charge. And um, one of these things that I haven't said in this lecture, but I've alluded to in the past, is that all of the fundamental particles um, have, seem to be uh, spinning. They seem to have, they have an axis associated with them, an orientation in space. Um, and uh, so uh, for all of them, <coughs> I'm taking the electron as an example, but for all of them, that, that means they have a, a magnetic field around them. And uh, there's, I'm not going to explain what this g minus 2 quantity is, but it's something <coughs> related to the strength of that magnetic field. Um, and you can, uh, you can predict this using our standard theory of physics, and you get a number. Um, there it is. And then when you measure it in the lab, this is probably one of the biggest successes. These things agree to, to nine, nine decimal places. You can see up to about here, they're, they're exactly the same. Um, there are very few other um, uh, theories in physics that can give you this kind of precision. Um, and then the only differences in these last few digits are, uh, are covered by the uncertainties with which we can uh, make the prediction. And that's, how, how is the prediction uncertain? Because you have to make, um, at some point you still have to make approximations in your math. And, uh, and you roughly know uh, how uncertain those approximations are. And of course, measuring, you, you, you certainly have some limit to how precisely you can measure something. But uh, you know, up to nine, nine digits here, that's, uh, that's really impressive measurement. So um, the bottom line for this standard theory of physics is that um, nothing we've seen in the lab so far uh, contradicts this. Everything, everything that we've seen so far fits into it um, in some manner. There's, there's been no blatant contradiction. Now, you may have heard in, in news stories here and there that there's been you know, maybe discrepancies observed. None of them have been um, uh, significant. The, uh, the error bars on all of these discrepancies have been large enough that, um, that it really uh, it isn't a smoking gun. So, so this really is kind of, uh, th this is the most successful theory we've had in particle physics. And, uh, and it's worked really well for about the last 40 years. So, um, all right, so what's wrong with it? Um, and I've, I've talked about this a little bit. I've worked this into uh, what I was saying. Um, you know, and this came up also in one of the questions. Why are there, uh, you know, why are there three generations? Why do we have three copies of matter? Um, and especially these two copies are, are unstable. They're only there for whatever we create in the lab. They're only there for a split second, and then they're gone. So, um, so what's going on here? You know, I compared it to the periodic table earlier. The, um, and uh, the structure of the periodic table led people to think that, well, maybe there's some underlying structure, some, some, uh, some underlying structure that's going to give you this pattern. And um, that's a possibility for, for this theory. Um, it's, it's certainly suggestive. Um, although, that being said, we, we don't have any evidence of underlying structure. Um, but it seems arbitrary. Why do we have three forces? Why do we have the strong nuclear, the weak nuclear, the electromagnetic? And I can include gravity in here, too. Why, why do we have, in this case, four forces? Um, that's not explained by the theory it's put in at the beginning. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just you know, ex taken for granted. Um, is there a pattern to the particle masses? You know, I showed you there are these wide ranges of masses, and especially the neutrinos, which have extremely tiny masses, so tiny that, that we haven't been able to measure them yet. Um, why is there this big disparity? Um, you know, why isn't everything the same mass? Or, 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 or some, why isn't there some pattern, at least, that we can discern? Um, so it seems like our, our standard way of thinking about physics is, is kind of arbitrary. And, and that's, it's not very intellectually satisfying. It's, again, it's been massively successful over the last 40 years, but it's, it doesn't it doesn't sit well with you, or at least you know, with me it doesn't. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of strange. Uh, what else? Um, uh, the amount of matter in the universe. You know, here you're looking at, you, you look out at the universe and we see matter everywhere. We don't see any um, evidence of significant antimatter galaxies or antimatter asteroids or anything like that. Um, and uh, I, I did say that our standard theory of physics does provide uh, a method of preferring matter over antimatter. But I said there's an asterisk, and here's the asterisk. 
if we look out at the universe, we don't see this. We see, you know, this. <laughs> that's, my, that's my really bad uh, animation here. But, um, and this isn't even to scale. We're, uh, the, the standard model of, of particle physics does predict a preference for matter over antimatter, but it comes up short. And it comes up short by a factor of about 100 million. I mean, it's kind of a glaring <laughs> problem. Um, you know, it, it seems like it seems like in a universe around us, matter is really strongly preferred over antimatter. Um, and, and our standard theory of physics, uh, it, it doesn't say that it's preferred that strongly. So it's, it's kind of strange. Um, so, uh, OK, so we're wrong by a factor of 100 million. That's, that's kind of a problem. Um, what next? Um, there, uh, it seems that we have a very successful theory of, of uh, matter, but um, what, what type of matter are we talking about? So uh, one of the things that was noticed um, uh, by uh, this guy, uh, Fritz Zwickley uh, in the 1930s, was that if you look at um, galaxies that are rotating, like this one, very similar to our, our own galaxy, um, it's, uh, it, you, uh, you count up everything you can see. You count up all of the stars, and you make an estimation for how much mass is in that galaxy. Um, that tells you, the amount of mass tells you how strongly this thing is held together by gravitation. And uh, Wiki noticed something really strange about these stars on, on the outside. Um, they were uh, rotating around too fast. Um, you know, the, this thing is rotating so fast that it should just, it should fly apart. And, um, and it's not doing that. These, there, there's something else pulling these, these stars um, into this rotation. Uh, instead of letting them fly out as, as they would normally do from just uh, centripetal acceleration, from you know, fleeing away from the center of this rotation. Um, so, uh, so what's going on there? Um, well, maybe, you know, maybe we got it wrong. Maybe, maybe there's more matter there than we can see. Um, it turns out that we've looked for it, and um, that doesn't seem to be the case. If there's you know, vast uh, dust clouds in here that are, that are unlit, um, they would still be illuminated by X-rays passing through or gamma rays passing through, um, and uh, and that's 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 not the case um, when we when we actually look at it. Uh, we can also um, go back to um, uh, theories about how the Big Bang developed, and um, this distribution of, of uh, matter here is consistent with what we think about how the universe evolved. So um, so what's what's going on here? The only thing left is either gravity's wrong. Um, or, or we're wrong about the amount of matter here. And um, it, it's a tough pill to swallow either way, but, but we, uh, we, we uh, understand gravity pretty well. At least every test we've made of, of uh, gravity and Einstein's version of it has been uh, held up by experiment. So we don't want to give that up. And so the only thing left is to assume that there must be just more matter here somehow. And we actually have some, some evidence for that. So, um, so what is this matter? <coughs> It's nothing we know about. It's not any of the 12 fundamental particles I showed you earlier. If it was, we would have seen it um, you know, illuminated by, uh, by um, high energy uh, uh, electrons or high energy gamma rays passing through. Um, so it's something that doesn't interact with, uh, with regular matter or with light. So we call it dark matter. Um, well, how can we get some handle on it? Uh, one way you can get a handle on it is um, uh, by uh, an interesting um, feature of Einstein's version of gravity, and that's um, what's called gravitational lensing. Um, the idea is um, light from, from distant galaxies uh, can actually get bent if it passes near something massive. This is actually one of the ways that Einstein's theory of relativity was, um, was confirmed, was that he, uh, he predicted, um, you know, if you look at the locations of uh, you know, uh, these stars, um, in the night sky, you'll see you'll see a certain location for them. Uh, but if you can look at them um, uh, during an eclipse, when when these stars, when the sun is in the sky and, and um, affecting the light from these stars, well, you can't see it when the sun is out because there's just too much <coughs> light. But you wait for an eclipse that masks the sun, at least it masks the light of the sun, and then you can actually see that um, the the position of these stars, the apparent position, has changed. And what's happening is as the light passes through um, space and uh, passes near the sun, um, in, in the case of Einstein, 
um, it gets bent a little bit. Now, the same thing happens throughout the galaxy. Um, you, you look at uh, uh, pictures from the Hubble, and um, if you're really good, you'll see um, distortions. And the distortions look very similar to um, if you put a, a wine glass on a piece of paper and look at the, the, the bottom of that. Um, you'll see a, a distortion from, from the shape of the glass. Very similar to the distortion you get from what's called gravitational lensing. You can use this as a tool to map out where the mass is. You can map out where, where are the things that are bending the light rays. And so uh, we can do this for certain, um, uh, for, for, uh, certain galaxies. And so, for example, what you're, what you're seeing here is um, two clusters of galaxies, uh, one moving this way, one moving this way, that have collided. And um, what's the color coding here? The blue is the distribution of mass that you get from gravitational lensing. So you look at the effects of gravity and, uh, and figure out, all right, where's all of the mass in these galaxies that have collided? Um, the pink here is um, the amount of mass that we can see through, um, through x-rays. Um, you've got basically this diffuse uh, cloud of gas. It's mostly hydrogen. Um, and, uh, and it's being heated up by you know, stars around it. And so that's committing x-rays. And so the x-rays are telling us where is all of the normal matter, the hydrogen basically, that's all in the middle. And this other mass out here, this kind of diffuse um, bluish area, is uh, way out on the side. So what, what's, what's happened here? What people think has happened is that these two galaxies were colliding head on. And all of the normal matter, matter here is stuck in the middle because it's, it's interacting, it's passing, you know, it's passing through, but it's slowed down by friction, basically, by, by uh, you know, hydrogen and uh, uh, stars and whatnot just um, kind of interacting with each other. And what's, what's passed through is the bulk of the mass, the, this blue area, which is dark matter. It's not releasing any x-rays. It's not, um, it's not interacting with light at all. As far as we can tell, it's not interacting with regular matter at all. That's why it's out here. Um, what's happened is these things have just passed through each other. And the, uh, the dark matter is out here on the edges, and the regular matter is stuck in the middle. So um, we don't see this with just one galaxy cluster of, of colliding galaxies. You can see colliding galaxies throughout the universe. And you see, um, we've seen several similar pictures of this. So this is actually one of the best uh, forms of evidence we have for dark matter is you look at its effect on gravity and, um, or you look at its effects from gravity and um, figure out where it is and, and see that it's not corresponding to, um, to regular matter. So uh, why, am I, why am I harping on dark matter so much? Because it's not predicted by our standard theory of physics. It's not, it's not in it at all. We know about 12 fundamental particles and uh, we're pretty sure that, <coughs> that dark matter isn't covered by it. Um, so uh, how much of a problem is this? Well, if you look at all of the matter in the universe, turns out the bit we know about is this. This is regular matter, and a huge fraction of it is, uh, is dark matter. So this is, again, one of those uh, glaring uh, errors where everything looks great in the particle physics lab, but when you look out at the universe, um, there are some unanswered questions. Um, the last one I'll mention is, um, is something even a little more mysterious. Um, what you've got here is a picture of how, uh, how we think the universe has evolved from, from the Big Bang to, uh, you know, to the present day. And what you see at the end here is that there's a little bit of flaring um, in the size. What this thing represents is the size of the universe as time goes on. And what's this flaring at the end to indicate? It, it, it represents our um, uh, discovery just in the last 12 to 15 years or so that um, space itself is um, expanding. Uh, the universe is expanding, and not only is it expanding, it's, it's speeding up. Um, how do we know this? Uh, one of the things, one of the tools, is to use um, supernovas. If you use a very specific kind of supernova, um, with uh, you know, coming from a specific kind of star, uh, you know what its brightness is supposed to be. You know, you, you know um, how bright it's supposed to be. And uh, using the, that level of brightness or dimness, you can tell um, how far away it is. The other thing you can get from it is color. Um, and uh, the way this works is, um, you know, if you, if you think of um, an ambulance uh, passing by you, as it's coming towards you, you know, it sounds kind of higher pitched. It passes you and moves away. It sounds lower pitched. 
what's happening there is something called the Doppler effect. And so um, the analogy for, for light now, instead of sound, is that things coming towards you at astronomical scales are going to be shifted blue. They're going to be shifted to higher or uh, shorter wavelengths. And as they're moving away from you, um, this is like the angle that's going away, they're going to be shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. So if you have brightness and you have color um, with these supernovas, you can get distance and speed. How far away is it from you and how fast is it moving? And what we find is the things that are farther away from us are moving faster. And as we look farther and farther away, they're moving faster and faster. So the universe really is expanding. And um, there's, a, there's not a good explanation as to what's providing the energy for this expansion. Things are all moving away from each other. Um, what's, what's fueling this? We don't know. We call it dark energy. It has nothing to do, as far as we know, with dark matter. Um, but it gets the name dark again because we, we don't know what's supplying this source of energy. Um, and if you now take the energy budget of the entire universe, um, the energy you know, that you see from the universe expanding, the energy you see from dark matter, and the energy from regular matter, you have a picture that looks something like this, where a huge fraction of uh, all of the energy in the universe is just going into expanding it, making it bigger. A smaller fraction, 22%, is dark matter, stuff we know nothing about. So all of this here is stuff we know nothing about. And then the last bit here is that, you know, intergalactic gas and, and stars and, and regular matter. You know, this 4% here, this is what we know about. This is our, our most successful theory of physics. It's very successful for about 4% of all of the energy in the universe. So when you look at when you put it that way, it's almost, it's kind of embarrassing. It's a, it's a fantastically successful theory in the lab, but on astronomical scales, it, it leaves a lot of questions to be answered. So, um, so in the last few minutes, how is the LHC going to help us? The Large Hadron Collider, I showed this picture last week, um, it's uh, on the border of France and Switzerland. It's a proton accelerator, um, 17 miles around, and um, it accelerates protons to the highest energies we've ever been able to achieve uh, in the lab. Right now, it's been running at about um, half of at about half of its full energy, but even that is still the highest that's ever been done. Um, and so what are we doing? We're colliding protons with other protons, and um, what all of this energy is going towards, this kinetic energy, is um, we're hoping that it can supply the energy to create the mass of heavy particles that we haven't discovered. So for example, the Higgs boson, that something we expect to see, um, hopefully we'll see it here. Um, dark matter. Uh, if, we, if, if dark matter is really massive, we might be able to create it in the lab and actually be able to study it a little bit. Um, so, uh, so what we've done here is, or what, what the plan is, is to collide protons together a billion times a second at four different locations around the ring. Um, what we've done so far this year is we've reached about five million collisions a second, which is pretty good. Um, so uh, so we're, we're starting to ramp up. Um, and it's five million at, at each of the four points um, per second. So, um, so how do we observe what's coming out of here? Uh, you have here examples of two of these giant particle detectors. This is the experiment I work on. It's called Atlas. You can see a person standing there for some scale. This is the uh, competing experiment, CMS. You might be able to see a ladder over on the side. Where is it? Uh, yeah, you might not be able to see the ladder, actually. <laughs> it's a big experiment. Um, they're, they're both hugely big. What are they doing? There are these uh, particle detectors that are based around the collision points where these protons are, are hitting each other. And they're basically like um, giant cameras. You know, your, your camera might be um, you know, a few megapixels if, uh, if you've got a pretty fancy one, maybe up to 10 or so if you're real fancy. These things are the equivalent of 100 megapixel cameras. That is, there are 100 million um, uh, measurements uh, being uh, that can be read out um, from these detectors, uh, and and actually most of those are are actually coming from uh, material that is pretty similar to the material inside your 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 uh, camera. Um, so uh, when I talk a little bit more about what the LHC has found so far, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about how these detectors work. But uh, for for now, we've got basically giant hundred megapixel cameras looking at these collisions. What do they see? This is an example of um, the results of uh, an actual collision that we saw earlier this year. Um, and it's a, uh, a, a 
candidate, it's a, it's a, it's what we expect a, um, one of these weak uh, force particles to look like, one of these things that mediates weak interaction. So, uh, so what you're seeing here, uh, this, this red line, um, this represents the path of a, uh, of a muon. This is the heavy cousins of the electron. You see a lot of other stuff in, the, uh, in uh, our display here. All of these other things are just other charged particles. The reason they're bent is because they're inside a, uh, a magnetic field that bends the paths of charged particles. Um, most of them are, are just junk that we don't care about. The interesting thing here is this one that's, uh, you can see it's not bent at all. It's, it's pretty straight. That means it's got a pretty high energy. Um, that's what made this event interesting to us. And the other interesting thing about this is that if you add up all of the momentum of everything that you see here, um, uh, ideally you should get uh, zero. Because uh, why? Because this is a head-on view, and um, we have this uh, principle in physics uh, and uh, chemistry also, you, you may have heard of it, it's conservation of momentum. Um, that you can't create or destroy uh, momentum. Similar to energy, you can't create or destroy energy. And so when we add up all of the, uh, uh, the momenta of these particles here, we should get zero as you go all the way around. Um, we don't get zero, we actually get an imbalance. And the, uh, um, this dotted line here shows you where that imbalance would have to be filled in. And so what's this, what's this dotted line? We think that's a, a, a neutrino, um, something that doesn't interact at all with our detector. We just infer its presence by looking at everything else and saying, this thing must have been there or else all of physics is wrong. <laughs> so, um, so we're pretty sure it's there. So this thing looks like a, um, uh, the, the decay products of one of these um, uh, W particles. Now, what's a, what's a Higgs going to look like? Um, one of the things that, uh, that the Higgs could do is actually decay into two of these Ws. This is why we want to see Ws and other types of particles in our detector now. Um, is, to, uh, is to start calibrating what we're, what we're looking for. So instead of one of these really uh, straight, energetic um, paths, uh, you would see two of them. Now there's a lot of other things that look like that, so it's, you, know, you have to do a lot more work, but that's, that's a rough idea of what we're looking for. And we're also looking for some imbalance to indicate that there, is a, a, there are neutrinos in the event, um, these undetected particles. Um, the other thing that we, so that's, that's if we want to detect the Higgs. If we want to detect dark matter, we're looking for even more of this stuff, even more of an energy imbalance in our detector. Because dark matter is not like regular matter, it doesn't interact with anything, so surely it's not going to interact with our detector. And so the only way we can see dark matter would be if um, we just see a very large energy imbalance. So, uh, so that's one of the potential signals. So. Um, so that's why, that's why we, we built the LHC, and, and in uh, a couple of weeks I'll tell you about what we've actually found so far. Um, so, uh, so to start wrapping up, um, this is what we know about particle physics. And again, for the last 40 years, it's been extremely successful. But, um, but what's wrong with it? Well, it's incomplete. There's dark matter, huge amount of it out there, four to five times as abundant as this stuff. There's um, the expansion of the universe, which is being driven by a huge source of energy. We have no explanation for it. I should say the LHC doesn't hold out much hope for, for telling us about this energy because um, we can calculate the density of it, and the density of that energy is, um, is too low for us to see any of its effects in this lab. Um, it, it only, it's only on astronomical scales when you go to really huge distances that it, that it has an effect. So there are other physics experiments going on um, trying to pin this down, but we're not going to do it at the LHC. Um, and of course, the other incomplete part of the standard model is it doesn't include gravity at all. Um, unless on the off chance, you know, we make micro black holes in the lab or something, that would be pretty exciting. And, uh, we, we talked about that a bit last week. At least they won't destroy the world. Um, all right, so, um, so uh, the LHC has been running since March of this year. Um, and uh, so far, we've observed all of these at the LHC. We've, we've observed everything that we've discovered so far. Um, and what that does is, one, it tells us that, uh, that we at least built these detectors correctly. Um, and it also helps us to calibrate our detectors. 
if we, if we know what we're looking for, we can use that to calibrate uh, what are the signals that we're seeing come out of it. And that's really um, setting the staging ground for um, hopefully making new discoveries. So, uh, so we've stopped colliding protons for this year. Um, they've actually moved on to colliding lead ions, which is uh, not my field of physics, but there are a lot of people um, looking at uh, these collisions of lead nuclei. Um, so we're going to start colliding protons again in late February, early March of next year, and run for at least a year. If we find something, they'll let us run longer before, uh, before shutting down for the upgrade to the full energy. So, um, so I'm pretty optimistic about finding something new in the next year. You know, there's a lot of questions here. These, these are all names of different uh, theories that, that might be discovered. Um, but of course, from my perspective, um, the, the thing that would be most interesting is if it's something that uh, nobody predicted, and it, and it gives us a completely new direction. So, um, so that's why we built the LHC. We've got an amazingly fantastic, fantastically successful theory, um, but we know it's incomplete. And we're hoping by um, providing the energy to create masses of new heavy particles, um, we can uh, discover um, what's the next step. Where, you know, what can explain the structure we see in the standard model. Um, so in a couple of weeks, I'll, I'll tell you about what the LHC has actually found so far. So uh, thank you. like nuclear, uh, nuclear distances, its, its effect is actually pretty hard to see. What it, what it does is um, it does have a, a force between, say, electrons and other electrons, um, but it's not keying in on their electric charge. It's keying in on their weak nuclear charge. Um, so, uh, and, and because it's so weak, um, it's, you know, it's much weaker than the electromagnetic force, um, it's, it's hard to see those effects. The other thing it does is it allows the neutrinos um, to have some, uh, it, it gives another interaction between neutrinos and, um, and things like electrons. Uh, because neutrinos can't interact uh, electromagnetically at all, they have no charge. But they do have a weak charge, and so the, the Z um, has some effect on, on that as well. I mean, what they've, one of the first experiments to, um, to indicate that there might be a Z had shown um, uh, when you put a lot of neutrinos at, at, a, at a target of uh, regular protons, you would, you would um, or a, a gas basically, you would occasionally see electrons just kind of take off in some direction on, on their own with no apparent um, cause. And the, the interpretation was that it was a neutrino interacting um, with that electron uh, via this Z weak force, but it's, um, yeah, I didn't mention it mainly because its, its effects are, are so weak, um, and, uh, and it, but uh, it's certainly it's certainly a part of our, our standard theory. It's one of the things that, that we have seen already at the uh, the LHC. Um, yeah. Would the Higgs boson be the smallest unit of mass? Uh, no. Um, now the funny thing the funny thing about the Higgs, and I I, I didn't explain this um, earlier, was that the Higgs. Um, you know, I said it kind of permeates through space like a like a fluid almost, um, and uh, kind of not ridiculously different from the ether, but um, <laughs> ether is a loaded it's a loaded word, yeah. Um, 
So what, what would the Higgs look like in that picture I was, I was showing you? It would, I guess if, if we're thinking of the Higgs as water permeating everything, uh, a Higgs particle would be like ice or something passing through that water. It would be in a different form of the same substance. And it actually can interact with that water, and it, so it has an interaction with itself, and that corresponds to the mass of the Higgs. Um, we think it's a fairly heavy particle, something around the same mass as the weak force carriers, but, um, but we haven't seen it. Um, so it, you had a comment on this, right? Yeah, you know, the Higgs, way you have mentioned it, the Higgs would be a spin zero. Yeah, I have, I have scalar particle there. All that's the right. Forces yeah. are vector, and yeah. the graph time is supposed to be temporary yeah. spin zero. So what, he, what he's pointing out is, um, is that <clears throat> The, the, the mathematical description for how the Higgs works is, is very different from the mathematical description of how all of the other particles work. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's another, I think, weird, that's another oddity of the standard picture of physics, especially because we haven't found the Higgs yet. So that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons we want to find it, to see what properties it actually does have. So it's actually, it's not the smallest unit of mass, but it, it, um, but, uh, it it's actually a fairly heavy, we expect it to be a fairly heavy. Um, yeah. Um, the range of masses on the different neutrinos. The, neutrinos. the muon is about 800 times the mass of the electron. Ah, uh, okay. These are not neutrinos. These are the, the charged, charged ones. I think. Unless, are, or are you? The electron neutrino, the muon. The ones that you have on your chart. Neutrino. Those are and not showing they, the masses. They, Those are showing the the upper limits on the masses. We know that the masses are smaller than what you're seeing there. Okay. But we but know how small. <laughs> there is a possibility that they're radically different masses. Certainly, yeah. That so how do they oscillate one among the other? So, yeah, so this, this, um, this picture is a little bit uh, simplistic um, because uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. The, Masses of the neutrinos, um, or a, a neutrino of a certain mass, will actually have, it, it won't be just an electron neutrino or a muon neutrino. It will actually be um, kind of a, a, probability a mix. probability of? Yeah, it will be a mix of, of the three types of neutrinos. Um, and it's a very, if you haven't studied quantum mechanics, this is a very difficult idea to, uh, <laughs> to explain. Um, so, uh, so yeah. A, a, when you, I'll put, I'll put it this way, the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino, in and of themselves, do not have well-defined masses. Um, the only way you can uh, define a mass is, um, is by taking various combinations of them. Um, off the top of my head, I think that's the best explanation I can give, but uh, I, I mean, your, your point in that, you know, they can be vastly different, that's, that's Certainly possible, yeah. Um, so we'll take a few more questions. Okay, we're running out of questions anyway, so we'll go way in the back, yeah. Yeah, has anybody come up with a plausible idea of why the up and down quark masses are so similar since the masses of the quarks in the different families are so different? The short answer is no, and it's because we don't have a plausible idea for why any of the masses are the way they are. Um, it's. Uh, yeah, it's um, that that part's a mystery. I, I I don't have a good explanation of that. Okay, there's a question less farther in the back. Yeah, an easy one, hopefully. You said the atlas and the other detector are competing. Why? Wow. <laughs> you said that twice now. Yes, um, I say they're competing because they are they have very similar purposes. They're both um, uh, detectors that are that are geared towards um, uh, general discoveries. And what I mean is they're they're built in such a way. So it's to be sensitive to a, a wide variety of, of signals. And um, uh, I say they're competing. I mean, it's a, it's a friendly competition, but because uh, we are trying to do the same things. Um, so uh, part of the reason for that is, um, is that it's useful to have confirmation. You know, if one experiment sees something with one set of equipment, and the other experiment has a completely different um, set of detectors, different technologies, and if they see the same thing, then that's really valuable. Um, it's, a, it's very good to, to have a cross-check. 
Um, now, that being said, each of us wants to be the first one and have the other guy be the cross-check. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it actually pans out. It, it'll probably be a combination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when you describe that uh, the kids kind of drag the part yeah. of the human, but at the same time, if the mass, this, this part of we have velocity, it, it's not dragging it, it's giving it its, its, its moment. Yeah, so this is where my metaphor breaks down, yeah. <laughs> um, right, yeah, the, 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 yeah. Um, if you think about it, yeah, if you think about it too much, the metaphor is just going to break down. So the, um, the, the, the main point is, it's the interaction with this medium. It's the interaction with this, uh, what's surrounding uh, all of the particles that tells you what the masses are. It, it's, um, that's, that's the main point of the metaphor. So, I think there is one or two more questions. Yeah? I've been wondering, when you were showing the strong force, yeah. Ah, why aren't, why aren't they annihilating each other? Um, so, uh, they, uh, the, the short answer is that they would eventually. So one of the pictures I showed was um, uh, an up quark and an anti-up bound together. And um, that's, that situation is only going to last for a very short time. I think it's like uh, oh, 10 to the minus 15th seconds or something. It's very, it's, it's, a, it, it's only, it's not really stable at all. It's a very short-lived um, state. So that, I mean, that would be you know, one of the other problems of trying to pull these things apart, trying to pull quarks apart, is that they create these states um, where, uh, you know, you've got anti matter and antimatter together, and they're going to try to annihilate pretty quickly. Um, you can get similar things with um, uh, just electrons and positrons together. They can actually be bound together for a very short time in something that's very similar to a, a hydrogen atom, um, except instead of a positively charged proton, you have a positively charged positron. Um, but that situation, that situation won't last for long because it's matter and antimatter. They will eventually annihilate. So, well, is there any possibility that dark matter could be made up? The, the, the answer is yes, with an asterisk. <laughs> and, and so, um, yeah, so one of, the, one of the big mysteries of the universe is um, where did all the antimatter go? And um, one possible answer that's been floated is that maybe it all got shuttled into, into dark matter. And because dark matter is, is completely different from, from regular matter, um, the type of antimatter that you have there is different from the type of matter you have here, and so you can't get direct annihilations. Um, this is a theory that's out there. It's possible. Yeah, we, we don't know what dark matter actually is. There, we, we think, in analogy to regular matter, that it has dark matter and anti-dark matter, but, but um, we don't know. Yeah, so that's, that's a theoretical possibility. Yeah. So I think we have maybe one more question. Oh, now I'm seeing a few more hands drop up. So uh, I haven't heard from you yet. So. <laughs> is the expansion of the universe due to the Big Bang, or is it due to this um, unknown force? The, yeah, this is a, this is a good question. So yeah, the expansion of the universe. Um, initially, um, at, at the beginning of the universe, most of the expansion. Uh, if I have any astronomy colleagues here, they're going to um, get in trouble with this statement. But very roughly, um, the expansion was driven by the Big Bang at the beginning. And inertia. Um, uh, inertia, yeah, and, and whatever initial explosion set it off, yeah. Um, but, uh, and what you would expect as time goes on is that um, gravity is an attractive force. You would expect everything to be pulled back in. Um, but that's, that's not what's happening. And, um, and so uh, what, what we're observing now is that um, if it was just, if the expansion was just from the Big Bang, it wouldn't be accelerating, it would be slowing down at least from gravity. And we're not seeing that, we're seeing it expand even faster. And so there's, that takes energy and, and we don't know where that energy is coming from. So, um, all right, if you have any remaining questions, I'll stay, uh, I'll stay down here for a little bit longer. So, uh, thanks for coming.